welcome to Vital Voices. I'm John Schwartz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Service. I'm really glad everyone could be here. Welcome to the people in the room and online, including my ALF friends who came today and our department chair and faculty and students who came. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited about this Vital Voices. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about UHD. We are the second largest university in Houston, uh, and we are the most diverse, not just in Texas, but in the Southern region. Uh, we play a really important role in Houston and especially in downtown Houston. In the College of Public Service, we have award-winning programs in social work, in education, and in criminal justice. Uh, and really try, I feel like we really train the leaders of the future for Houston. So I'm glad you, we've had Vital Voices for a while really talking about important issues that impact everyone. And I think this is really an important one. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the director of our center who puts together Vital Voices, Stephen Villano, who's gonna introduce our speakers. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for attending tonight's Vital Voices. Thank you for those of you who are here in the room. Um, I wanna tell you that I was interested in, in this subject because during COVID, I was lonely. Um, it was a hard time. Uh, it's just my wife and I, our, my son um, uh, moved out of the house and actually recently got married. And um, so it was just a hard time. I couldn't even volunteer. No one would take during COVID. It was just difficult to volunteer. So I finally got to volunteer and I volunteered with uh, Meals on Wheels. And I, what I saw was just, heartbreaking. I mean, delivering meals to people who are all by themselves, some of them in a trailer, that, that's it, they're in their trailer all day long. No one comes to see them, they don't get out. The contact with the people who bring the meals on wheels is their only contact. Um, so it just really struck a chord with me. And then the other thing that really strikes a chord with me is that, you know, in today, you know, I love Zoom. I mean, obviously we're here on Zoom. Uh, but, you know, we'll have a meeting, and everybody will be on campus, but we'll have a Zoom meeting. We don't come together anymore. You have your groceries delivered. You don't go to the store anymore. You don't get a chance to say, oh, you, haven't see, you, you see somebody in the store that you haven't seen in a while, and you stop and you chat. That, that, kind, of, that kind of doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, so, I, you know, I thought it was just me, and then I did some work on it, and I was like, you know, did some research on it, and no, it wasn't me, and lo and behold, there was the Surgeon General report, and I looked at that and read that, and that was a little reassuring. And then I thought, well, why don't we do a session on it? And so I said, who, who can I get to speak? I called the Surgeon General's office, and I never got a call back. Um, so I decided that, you know, let me look to see who reviewed this report. And lo and behold, Dr. Smith from Texas A&M, he was one of the people that reviewed it. And I will tell you, don't know the man, never met him prior to my calling him, and he was like, yeah, sure, I'll come talk. Without, without hesitation. Didn't know me from a hole in the wall, and yet he was very willing. And, and Dr. Smith literally travels the world speaking, um, and yet he found the time to come down. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he was in Scotland. A couple, uh, next week, he's gonna be out of state again. Uh, so he was very willing to come and speak, and he is an, really an expert, as he'll explain to you, uh, all, all of the things that he has done, all of the research that he has done, the different panels that he's on, the different committees that he's on, the different organizations that he's with, that he sits on. Uh, so th we, we couldn't be more blessed to have someone of his caliber here with us. So I really thank you, Dr. Smith. And Dr. Lee, come to find out, so I called her, I called uh, the Harris Center because I wanted someone local to uh, come speak to about the situation locally here in the Houston, Harris County area. And so I called the Harris Center. I called the, um, the executive director there who I had a little bit of um, experience working with. And he was like, no, I can't do it, but let, let's see if, if Dr. Lee will do it. Um, she's our head medical doctor, so I, great. So we started talking and same way, sure, I'll come talk. And then come to find out she's in a leadership uh, uh, program with uh, our Dean, Dr. Schwartz. So uh, who knew? So um, she was very willing to come even before she knew that uh, I was with UHD, I think. So um, we are really, really, really fortunate to have these two speakers here uh, to speak on this issue that affects young people, I, I think more than it does older people. As we were saying this morning when we were on uh, the local news, 
while um, isolation affects a, a pe older people more, younger people report more incidences of feeling lonely than do older people. Um, the physical, uh, the physical ramifications of, of extreme loneliness is equivalent to, to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And, and there's, uh, they, as they will tell you, they are the experts, other, other physiological uh, symptoms that you can get in your body. So without further ado, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Dr. Smith come up and speak. He'll share some slides. Dr. Lee will come up and speak and share some slides. Then we're gonna have them all three of them sit together at the table and Dr. Schwartz will lead them in a discussion and we'll uh, entertain questions from the audience here as well as from the audience online. So without further ado, Dr. Smith. Well, I'm always willing to come talk to a great audience about a very important topic. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Let's go ahead and get this started. So as was mentioned, I have done quite a lot in the space of social connection. And, and we all know that loneliness, social isolation, or general disconnection is not anything new. This isn't something that has just currently started to affect our population. In more reality, it's something that has just been put on display based on the COVID situation, the pandemic. So now there's a lot more attention, there's much more that's actually happened, so that now we're starting to understand more about the ramifications, we're starting to get more widespread attention, we're starting to get more groups interested and involved, and that way we're actually starting to bring this to a, a way that we can start to address it with practical and realistic solutions. So I would love to go ahead and start with a few definitions, because these are very interrelated concepts, but they're not the same, and unfortunately they're used interchangeably sometimes, and what you're talking about many times isn't really what you're meaning to talk about. And I don't mean you all, I mean whoever it shall be. But nonetheless, that means we're talking past each other, and the only way to make progress is to make sure that we're using similar terminologies. So when we talk about isolation, we talk about that objective measure, that objective measure of not having a large social group, not having any social group, not having a family structure, maybe not having any opportunity to interact with others. So it's that physical, objective isolation and that inability to interact. Now with that, we note that some of this has to do with the family and the social networks. Beyond that, it also has a lot to do with the social networks or the lack thereof. But generally across the board, we see that the social determinants of health, whether it be financial insecurity, whether it be limited transportation or access, certainly contributes to this across all ages universally. But we also do see that we note that mobility issues, especially I do a lot with older adults. So physical mobility issues or the inability to be mobile within your community certainly contributes to isolation, but as do impairments, whether they be physical, whether they be sensory or whether they be cognitive. So those impairments can also create a lot of issues for individuals. So isolation, that objective, when we talk about loneliness, we're really talking about that subjective feeling of being isolated. So this is a little bit more of that perception of being alone. And again, it's a bit of the distress from having an inadequate set of meaningful connections. So really what it talks about is from what I prefer to what is actually happening, there's a disconnect. I want more connection, but I'm not getting enough connection. And based on that, that's the feeling of loneliness. And so with that, we see also the family or household structure contributes to this, but so does the social network. But now it's more about these meaningful, deep, purposive kind of quality interactions between people. Things that really give you that sense of bonding or belonging, companionship. You know, that's the loneliness that people are missing the companionship, people to understand them, know what it's like to be me. So then we talk about the general connection. And this is an umbrella term. This is actually a continuum. It takes into consideration all of what we just talked about with loneliness and isolation, but it transcends that because it breaks it down based on not only the structure of your social um, infrastructure, your social network, whether you have one or not, 
but also the functions that these individuals play and the function that you play within your social network. And in addition to that, how quality it is. So is it positive, is it negative? How are my relationships and how do I view those? And so when we think about that, we're really thinking about social connection as quality, meaningful interactions. And these all encompass the concepts of inclusion, support, whether it be cohesion, bonding, um, integration, engage, all of these things, because that's what we're looking for. So we're really looking at these concepts, and there are so many more that are encompassed. But I really want to make this distinction that when we talk about isolation and loneliness, we think about isolated people who might live alone. And maybe they do live alone. But this, just because you live alone doesn't necessarily make you lonely. So it's really important to realize that individuals who are isolated might not be lonely. And that's totally acceptable, that's a preference. But at the same time, an individual can be completely surrounded by others but feel completely alone. So it doesn't always have to go with the proximity or the level of interaction, it's the meaningfulness of those interactions. Sometimes in generational households, we have individuals who reside in the same home but they don't interact much. Maybe the television's going, maybe there's nothing that we can talk about in common ground and therefore, that person is still lonely despite being surrounded. So that's where I really focus on social connectedness or disconnectedness. And when we think about this and the Surgeon General's report that came out utilized this wonderful infrastructure, it's really that umbrella term about general connections to others. And it's broken down by structure, function, and quality. Structure is more of that objective isolation so it's more of you don't have a social network, you don't necessarily have enough individuals to meet your needs. Whereas the function is more about the roles that you play or others play to give you support or make you feel that you have support or even the feelings of loneliness, that's about function because you're looking for companionship. But beyond that, we talk about the quality. Just because I naturally have some form of social network doesn't mean all of my relationships are great. There might be a lot of conflict. There might be a lot of strife. And if that's the case, then again, the quality of that relationship is not going to be great and it contributes to my disconnection. So when you think about things and the ways that we identify these activities, when you talk about structure, questions like this, there are enough people I feel close to that I can call for help. Enough people means I have enough of these individuals. My social network is deep enough. When we talk about I feel isolated from others, that's functional. Somebody who's making me feel more connected, making me feel like I have more companionship. It's a feeling, whether I feel like I'm supported. And then of course, quality. We talk about I'm content with my friendships or relationships, the way I feel about the positivity of those and what I'm getting from that. So as mentioned before, we really think about loneliness and social disconnection across the life course. I focus a lot on older adults, but at the same time, we do realize that about half of all adults have experienced loneliness or disconnection in the recent years, half. Now, that doesn't mean they experience it every single day, but they are experiencing it. But with that, in a wonderful survey conducted by a dear colleague, um, Dr. Louise Hawkley, she used the general social survey to indicate levels of loneliness across the age decades. And as you can see here, that more Younger individuals in their 20s and 30s are experiencing loneliness relative to their older counterparts. It's almost a U-shape until you get until the 80s and 90s where it might actually start to come up again. But when we talk about that older age or that middle age, they're experiencing loneliness less than their younger counterparts. Now, in a study that we conducted, a national study of employed individuals across the country in 2021, we also found this same trend. We saw that when we look at social disconnection, when we look at depression, that the younger individuals were having more of these conditions than their older counterparts, and significantly. And so this is in line with many of the other studies that we see where these younger individuals are experiencing it, but the problem becomes that because of the health ramifications of loneliness or general disconnectedness, older adults might have more intensified ramifications or consequences to their health, to their mental health, um, and other aspects. 
So I always like to make sure that I emphasize that social disconnection can impact anyone. We know that some people might be at more risk than others, but it impacts everybody across ages, across origins, across backgrounds, socioeconomic levels, geographies, it can impact everybody. And we know that there are certain age-related age risks, but we also know that the social determinants of health, employment status, uh, financial resources really do contribute to disconnection. I already mentioned about impairments, but what we also talk about now more than ever, we're having individuals with multiple chronic conditions. And when you have multiple chronic conditions and maybe you're balancing a family at home and maybe you're also employed, well, now all of a sudden the connection aspects might be less. You need more social supports. That function or that quality might be hindered. So we're starting to see some of these complications arise as more and more individuals have complex chronic conditions. They need to self-manage, whether or not they have that transportation. Talk about technology, of course, because we know that technology can be great to bring people together but also you lose a bit of that. Overuse or incorrect use actually creates more disconnection. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit later. And we talk about marginalized identity. Anybody who feels that they're marginalized, anybody who doesn't have that sense of belonging in a community is much more likely to feel disconnected, feel lonely. And then communication or language barriers are certainly. So what we know is that when a person is disconnected, it impacts every aspect of their life, their physical, their mental, and their behaviors. But I know that Dr. Lee will talk about that a bit more, so I'm gonna move on from that. So the great news is there's a lot more attention and awareness given to this. And actually, it started right in 2020. There was the NASM report, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, that released a report about social isolation and loneliness for older adults in healthcare settings. And it identified the problem, it identified measures. Chapter six is phenomenal. And then also what it did was it gave practical and realistic solutions that we can do as a society. It released right in 2020, no one knew that the pandemic was coming, but it was perfectly timely. It started to give a lot of attention. Of course, just in the past year, the social media and youth and mental health report came out from the Surgeon General. Dr. Murphy's doing great things. And finally, we love this because these are the kinds of attention, the reports that we need to be able to give everybody the awareness and give action, national priority. And so it's starting to happen. And what we're starting to see with that youth is again, identifying the risks of social media, but also knowing that there are benefits to social media and technology, but there are a lot of risks that need to be addressed. And we can always talk about that. But really what we're here to talk about is this epidemic of loneliness and isolation because this report was absolutely phenomenal. And it was something that we've been pushing for as a group uh, for a very long time, and finally, it happened. And this pivotal report is absolutely phenomenal. It has four different chapters to it. Uh, but what it does is it actually announces social connection as a national priority. First time that it's really been done. And with that, it also outlines a national strategy that goes across diverse sectors, and diverse stakeholders and how we can act cohesively to make change. And that's tremendous. And the best part about it is it's easy to read. So even though it's about 85 pages, you can get through it pretty quick. Got a lot of pictures, which you can see here. But it really does identify so many of these different opportunities that we can engage in that also align and leverage different ongoing initiatives. So it has six pillars that it's focusing on and of course, I, I don't need to read these to you, but what I really do appreciate is one, we need a better social infrastructure to have programming, opportunities, resources for individuals. But it also needs to focus at the governmental level and be more inclusive and all inclusive. Beyond that, it certainly needs to talk about the healthcare sector, which that first NASM report did, but also think about technology. And beyond that, I love number five, research because we need to learn more about what works and does it work universally for whom? And how do we get those into the hands of the people who need them most? Now, we as a uh, scientific advisory group for the Foundation for Social Connection, we're able to come up with this social connection framework. And this really leverages so much of what's been talked about. It looks at the various sectors of our community it looks at the socio-ecological framework, looking at the individuals, interpersonal, the organizations, society, policy, environment, all of these things, 
all together to say that there are many different strategies and solutions that we can do to leverage together to bring together our communities to address social isolation and loneliness. And so with that, there's cross-cutting um, concepts of the social framework that really look at not only time of lifespan and across the, the life course, but also issues of diversity, research and evidence, and of course, how is it that we're going to reach these individuals? And so we've been using a lot of this and many of the national initiatives are using this to be able to guide their efforts and make sure that this serves almost like a playbook, something that everybody can look at to use together so that we can start to know what each group in our society is doing so that we're not siloed, we're not duplicating efforts. We can work together, we understand how we can work together, and we can do so more efficiently. And those rare dollars that we have to be able to spend on this, we can actually use those more effectively, more efficiently, and reach more humans with things that work. Now, very quickly, I know this slide has a lot, but these are a lot of the global, national, and state initiatives that I've either worked on or I work very adjacently to. Um, but I wanted to point out some of these because if you're not familiar with them, this is where a lot of the action is happening. If you really wanna know what's happening in the world or in the United States, these are the groups that are doing it. And so with that, the World Health Organization uh, just recently brought together world leaders from all over uh, for a commission on social connection. So globally, this is now an initiative that is going to be addressed. There's also what they call the GILC, which is the Global Initiative on Loneliness and Connection. This has 15 to 20 different countries banding together to go ahead and address social isolation and loneliness, fostering connection, looking at their uniquenesses, sharing lessons learned and what works. Of those members here in the US is the United States Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness, the CECL. That's how I first got involved, was joining in with this coalition and they're part of the GILC. But they are doing tremendous work to advocate bipartisan for any kinds of solution that we can have that is more inclusive, more cohesive, and for more connection. With them is the foundation for social connection, and that's where I serve on the scientific advisory board. That's how I was so fortunate to be contacted for the Surgeon General's report. But with that, we're doing so much work to try to identify solutions, give practical guides, give practical applications, give more of an inventory of what's working to give to our communities. The CDC has what they call the BRIC, the Building Resilient and Inclusive Communities, phenomenal. I won't go into all of these, but Commit to Connect, that's again a federal entity, the Administration for Community Living, partnering with US Aging to bring together a national group of champions of community-based organizations to go and create interventions, disseminate interventions for older populations so that they can get more connected. I love that Stephen brought up Meals on Wheels America because they're doing great work and I'll talk a little bit about that in one second. But anyone here in Texas, there is the Texas Silk, the Texas Social Isolation and Loneliness Coalition. If you wanna be a part of that, that's great. I'm on the steering committee of it. We are looking for members because we want action here. We're utilizing the national coalition as a framework, but we certainly want Texas to be uh, much more inclusive and much more connected. Now, this is a busy slide, but I'm only gonna say like two sweeping statements. And that is, we need more programming, intervention, services, resources that can help people become more connected. Right now, there are not enough. Right now, if they do exist, we don't necessarily know their efficacy, if they work. We don't know how they work, if they work for certain people and not others. Maybe they're not accessible to everybody. So with that, what we're doing, and these are a lot of the projects that I'm involved in, we're trying to identify that, you know, sometimes interventions that are created for other reasons have indirect benefits. So we know that a program that's maybe created for chronic disease management or depression actually has benefit for social connection or reducing loneliness. Just by the mechanistic approach of bringing together individuals in a small group, having them meet consistently, talk about their challenges, brainstorm together, those mechanisms make cohesion, make people feel more connected to one another. And so we're starting to learn that we don't have to recreate that wheel. We can go ahead and utilize what we already have to be able to, again, challenge isolation and loneliness 
without necessarily having to create new programs. However, we create all kinds of new programs. So one of these, like the Reduce Silos, um, you know, again, is a community health worker group in a healthcare setting that navigates. So it's community navigation. Community health workers identify these older adults through their healthcare records, and they basically navigate them to other wonderful resources. And it's proving to be very effective. Virtual healthy habits. We have online education and congregate meals. Virtual, these individuals never see each other, but we're reducing loneliness. And it's fantastic how well these things can work because technology can be scalable and cheap. However, it doesn't necessarily replace what we know is important, and that's the true face-to-face -face human interaction. Meals on Wheels is doing great stuff too. So we just need to make sure that we continue with that. And so is US Aging. We're just doing a lot of different initiatives. So behind the scenes, when you start hearing about some of these wonderful programs, realize that it takes a team to really make this happen. So much. So then there are many different tools and repositories, and I hope that this will become available. But you know, there's wonderful videos from the World Health Organization about loneliness and social connection. There are toolkits from the National Institutes of Health. Um, Humana has this directory that they can go ahead and identify. You can identify social isolation of loneliness. They created a little subgroup that you can click this and you can type in your zip code and things that can help you can just pop up. So it's really convenient for wherever you live. Um, but I do wanna make sure there's also action guides, but these two in particular, the Foundation for Social Connection has an intervention catalog and the uh, administration, I'm sorry, the administration for community living as well as the US Aging has the Engaged Initiative, and they also have an Innovations Hub that's a catalog. You can go to these two sites and you can identify any intervention that has been shown promising or effective to address social isolation or loneliness. So that way, we're starting to build the repository, build the inventory. If you have a program that you know of, feel free to go and apply. We need more of this evidence because instead we're all working separately to create things that we could actually do better and faster and cheaper if we do things that are already known to work. So a lot of different resources there, but I'm going to stop and turn this microphone over because I'm sure I went long. So, to the next. Well, Thank you so make much. Make it happen. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Let's see. So, I have the. Oh, is it working? Okay. Sure. Okay. I have the privilege of really getting a chance to take what we started here with, which is sort of a macro perspective, and really boil it down to, well, how does loneliness impact you, 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 and you, and also those online, um, related to how you experience this, right? I think one of the important things that Matthew shared is it's a perception. It's a perception of how you experience the connections around you. And so I really wanna take some time to really talk through what are the potential consequences if you consistently feel lonely and socially isolated? Um, so what we're gonna focus on, and this is gonna be grounded in the social, uh, Surgeon General's report, is really the medical aspects of that, physical and emotional and really get deeper into what are the potential consequences. In my role, I get to directly provide care. So what that means is I do psychiatric evaluations of individuals in Houston and Harris County. I also serve as the chief medical officer of the Harris Center, which is the local mental health authority, which means that we get to also review what the trends are. What are the things our community needs and how do we go about giving them the things that are necessary when we develop and evaluate the types of programs that we want to build in order to support Houstonians. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about remedies and also things that you can take home as ideas for how you might integrate um, thinking about being a little bit less lonely, a little bit less socially isolated. Um, as Matthew mentioned, if we are as a country and the 
number is also reflected in Harris County and Houston, one in two, 50% of us feeling lonely than half of this room, right? And so it's important to just think about that. And it might be an experience that is happening for periods of time. And so it might not happen your entire life, but it is happening for periods of time. And how do you navigate that? How do you start to come out of it? How do you start to engage? And so we'll be able to focus on that. And I really want to ground it on what you might be able to take away and what you might be able to do if you're starting to notice some of these experiences in your life, in the people that are in your life, and also the broader community that we're part of. So the Harris Center, um, as I mentioned, we provide care for um, 2 million instances of care over the fiscal year 2023. That's a lot of care. And so during that period, we'd see a lot of different kinds of patients. And um, one of the things I like to share is that we serve the underserved community. So individuals that might not get care in any other way, uh, underinsured or uninsured. And so these are high needs individuals. And as a result, what we know in the spaces that we're occupying is that there are some of the individuals that really need care the most. And so as I sort of ground some of the conversations, I also want to share with you what I'm seeing clinically as well um, in folks that are raising their hand for care, right? And I know that this school um, is a school of public service, and so a number of folks are training to be therapists and social workers. And so it is really important to start to think about how you might be able to contribute to the community that you might be serving. So as we think about loneliness, right, there's the loneliness that you might feel by yourself, but you can also be lonely when you're around others. And so as we sort of brought up a little bit earlier, especially Matthew in the earlier presentation, you could be in this room and currently feel lonely. That could be an experience. Even though we're all here in person and online, you could be feeling lonely in this moment. And so when we think about loneliness and social isolation and what that can do for physical and mental health, Stephen's absolutely right. The data shows that the lack of social connection is as dangerous as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And we as a country have moved toward banning cigarettes in many public places, banning cigarettes in hotels, for health, for health. Can we ban social isolation? Can we get toward that? Can we start to think about how do we incorporate engagement a little differently in the social fabric that we're part of? Because there are some dire consequences to the way that social isolation and loneliness can have on you as an individual. And what we have seen is an increase in stroke an increase in heart disease, heart failure, high blood pressure, diabetes, the list goes on and on and on. If there is a health condition, social isolation probably worsens it, okay? So that's something to remember. Anything related to your health, if you're isolated and lonely, is probably going to deteriorate. And why does that really happen, right? Why is it that that might happen? Our state of mind is really connected to our body, right? In my professional experience, our mental health is connected to our broader body. And so when we're saying we don't really wanna, we, we don't feel ready to go out to talk to the world, we're gonna stay home today, or Ooh, we're just not motivated, or that's, well, that might be a small symptom, but it could also reflect something bigger. And the bigger part of what that can be linked to is that if you're feeling less motivation, less energy, social withdrawal, less and uh, less, um, more depression, less interest in eating, less uh, ability to um, do things that you love most of the days, well, that's the clinical definition of depression. And then you throw in, well, you know, it just gets worse and worse. And as I do little things, I just don't have um, as much confidence in it anymore. 
Well, that, that's a problem. You might need to see somebody when that happens, when it consistently happens for two weeks or more. That's the clinical definition of depression. And so what it could feel like as a small symptom might lead to something bigger over time, but your state of thinking can really impact how you interact and behave for the rest of your life. And so that's why isolation is an important marker for thinking about how you interact with the world, okay? So some of the possible consequences, when I went to residency and trained in psychiatry, one of the things that was really drilled, drilled deep into me is the biopsychosocial model. Okay, the biopsychosocial model. What that is, is that your biology is connected to your psychology and that's connected to the social sphere that you interact with and uh, embody. And so the biology is really a lot of our physical processes. And that might be your cardiovascular heart processes, that's your endocrine with your hormonal access, as well as your, even your gut biome. And when you're isolated, what is not as visible, right? You know, smoking can be invisible too, but what is not visible is that when you're withdrawing, not connecting with others, that can release stress hormones that ramp up. And, or, you know, you might be receiving um, the hormones that aren't the good ones, right? When you're bonding with others, right? I'm a new mom, I have a five month old at home, right? These are good chemicals that are out there when I hold my baby and I'm experiencing oxytocin, that's very, very good, right? But when you're sort of by yourself, not as engaged, not bonding, not having the good chemicals, not having the dopamine, well, <laughs> Maybe some others are running through, and that can be problematic. In addition, when we think about psychology, we think about meaning and purpose. What is the broader context of my life that's worth living? Well, you're by yourself. Nobody's talking to you about it, and you're not really engaging in conversation and really having the social interactions that allow you to engage around um, you know, what you're motivated with. And so you can experience positive behaviors or negative behaviors. And so when you're experiencing very negative behaviors, you can start acting out. Or when you are in social context, it's not good quality ones, as we were talking about a little earlier. So there's that deepening connection around the psychology of why somebody might be more isolated. In addition, when we think about the social aspect, right, some parts of that is linked to the fact that if you're wanting to stay away or be isolated, it's not building upon itself, right? When we think about how we engage with others, it's a foundation of trust, it's connection around values, it's connection around common interests. And so if you just never do it, then that can really impact your ability to have influence, to have peer connection and engagement. And you know what we do know is that, well, peer pressure actually kind of works when you want to develop healthy behaviors of you know, your spouse or your partner or your friends are all going toward a health goal. Well, you know, you don't want to get left behind, so you might start to engage in that and want to um, be more healthy. And so, you know, when you think about loneliness and social isolation, you kind of have to think about it in the broader context of your life and be able to start to um, recognize that really there is the biology connected to the psychology and to the broader social aspects. And so in addressing loneliness, I mean, um, Matthew mentioned about the different pillars, um, but I think that the point I want to make is that you can do things toward reducing loneliness and social isolation, and it could be a little thing at a time. It literally could be just taking one small action toward being able to engage a little differently, whether it's saying hi to somebody in the grocery store and just doing it to start to feel the conversation of talking to another person, 
Or it could be trying to, when you're talking to another, go a little deeper to listen a little bit more in a focused way as opposed to being distracted on your device and um, you know half listening, right? And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to really think about, hey, just a little bit differently, just a little bit more. So some of the trends, I mean, I was a little shocked that there wasn't more recent data. Maybe Matthew has that for Harris County and Houston, but the data I found was um, before the COVID pandemic. And, you know, we're on par na uh, with national. So Houston is on par with the United States where one in two feel lonely or socially isolated in our broader area. Um, in addition, what we have found is that people aren't accessing social engagement and social membership organizations. So only one in two, um, you know, are accessing that. And, you know, we as a county have fewer organizations to participate in compared to um, the U.S. overall as well, about half, which means that, you know, there isn't as many places to, org uh, to engage with. But hopefully, you know, by the groups that are here and those that are listening, you can start to build that for our community and to, to increase um, the ways in which we might be able to build civic engagement a little differently. Um, I looked, um, Kaiser um, Health Foundation, um, is a uh, family foundation is a really good resource to look at some statistics around um, physical and mental health conditions across the United States as well as across different areas. There's some data in Texas that suggests um, you know, we, we do have quite a bit. A poll survey um, essentially in 2023 showed that a third, more than a third in the Texas area are having anxiety and depressive disorder. And, you know, you can temporarily feel lonely, but if you're starting to notice that that's getting toward every single day with a lot of other things going on, then there is a potential that it is getting toward the level of needing and seeking professional help. Um, in addition, one of the things that I track very closely as a leader in a behavioral health organization is really, um, you know, when you have really severe mental health needs and one of the potential outcomes is suicide. And so we actually track that within our center, but I also follow the data in Texas. Um, and we are starting to notice increase says year after year, the suicide rate in America, as well as in Texas, has risen. And so it's important to recognize because if you don't, you're not aware that isolation and loneliness and um, disengagement can lead to mental health conditions, you might sort of, um, you know, you, you might be able to better early, uh, have some early intervention and be able to get help earlier. Um, and we have not made a dent in that, um, you know, ever. Um, and so it is really important for us as a society to start to look at the fact that this has not gone down and this is age adjusted. And so we'll want to sort of think about additional ways in which we can um, help individuals because this is not an outcome that we would want anybody to have. And so what is being done locally? Um, the Harris Center has a number of different kinds of programs out there. I'm not going to go into all of it. I think the key things I do want to mention is, um, you know, last year, if somebody is recognizing that they're in a behavioral health crisis, there's a new phone number out there. Instead of calling 911, you can actually call 988, which is um, an emergency mental health services number that is uh, helpful to resolve a behavioral health crisis. So if you're needing that, please feel free to uh, utilize it. The Harris Center also does have within the local mental health authority a call line that you can reach at any point is 713-970-7000. I should have written it in the slide. Um, but we have a lot of different programs that are part of our um, you know, continuum of care that um, is able to get you to the right place seeking the right kind of care. Uh, I also checked in with Stephen in advance to try to see, hey, like, do you guys have 
counseling here? Are there other access points for UHD students? And you do have a counseling center that folks can reach um, specialized help as well. The other thing to um, mention and highlight is that within organizations, within groups, it's important to develop the skills to start to have the conversation, right? And so um, it can be hard to say, I'm feeling lonely right now. I feel lonely right now. And it's okay. It's okay to feel that because once you start to have that awareness, self-awareness, group awareness, you can start to check in on other people. Hey, like, are you experiencing it? Could I help? Can we sort of talk more about this? And it's important because, you know, when we think about a resilient society, it starts from individuals being part of that solution and being part of that um, conversation to really get us um, toward the places where we want to go. I also have to give a shout out to American Leadership Forum. I really appreciate that there are organizations and also groups and programs out there that can interact and connect in a different way. You know, my colleagues are here supporting me, making me feel less lonely as I'm giving a presentation. And so I really appreciate being able to have those connections in order to support the work that we do more broadly to share and provide um, more resources out to the community about this topic. Now, what can you do individually? I highlighted at the beginning, hey, like I want you to have a couple of takeaways on what you can do um, yourself um, for the community around you uh, to help around this topic. And so I think one is raising awareness. Like who knew there was a Surgeon General's report? I mean, I knew and Matt knew, but um, you know, Hopefully you can tell the rest of the people around you that this is a public health crisis. That's an epidemic. You gotta, you gotta spread awareness um, because if you can use that and knowledge is power and spread that to others, hopefully others can benefit from a readable content that you know, allows you to know about this topic being raised to the highest level. Invest time in nurturing relationships. What that's about isn't, hey, like, honey, I'm just going to see my text. Everybody's going to do that at some point. But nurture your relationships. Really, really enhance the type of quality time that you might spend with your partner, with your friends, with your colleagues, because that matters. That really does matter. And when I was talking earlier about, you know, Matt was also talking about this, um, social media, like invest time in doing deeper listening. Everyone can gain the skill of just paying attention and looking somebody in the face. What I've observed in clinic as well as in life is that people are scared. They, they don't necessarily want to look other people in the eyes anymore. It is hard. It feels uncomfortable. But when you do it, people really value it. People really feel heard, and so it's important. Um, serve, support others, do your civic engagement, go out and volunteer, do your meals on wheels, you know, do your version of it, go ahead. And so participate in social uh, activities, be open to diversity. The idea is like we are part of some of the most diverse communities in the country here in Houston. So it is so important to be open to the idea that there are different voices out there and potentially different ways of connecting. And so be open to different types of faces that can interact with you. And when you connect with others, have dialogue. Be around people that look different than you and go and experience what that could look like. And when you do that in a non-judgmental, open way, people appreciate that, right? I mean, I speak Spanish when I talk to my nanny and she is very appreciative of that. And she's like, oh, you know, really know Spanish. And I was like, yeah, learned it in high school. And so we partner to teach my daughter about Spanish, you know? And I think there are so many different examples of ways that we can have deeper connections as a result of what we bring into it. So if there's any single thing that you learn from tonight, it's how you invest energy in the world can really impact the connections that you build around you. 
And so practice gratitude. I am truly grateful for all of you that are here on an evening listening about this topic because it is important. It truly is. And so I value the opportunity. Do the same for those that are around you. Share with them why you're grateful for the people that are in your lives. I mean, they're not going to be able to listen to it all the time. And I think that value the time that you could be spending with those folks and sharing that gratitude. And, you know, the last piece is reflecting on core values and what that can mean for you. And so I think that's it for me. But I am really thankful that you're here talking about this important topic. And I look forward to doing our fireside chat. Good. So we, um, uh, Dr. Lee, can you repeat that number? Because I had someone on the Zoom ask for the, the number, the 713 number. Oh, um, it is 713. 713. 970. 970. 7,000. 7, and what is that again? That is um, our main line at the Harris Center if you just have any questions about mental health. All right, so that's the main line number for the Harris Health Center if you have any type of question. So we're going to open this up to a discussion that Dr. Um, what is your name? Uh, <laughs> Dean Schwartz is going to uh, conduct. So if you have any questions, now would be the time to ask them. And for those of you who are online, uh, as I indicated in the chat, please ask away. We have an incredible panel here. So uh, please ask any questions you may have. Dr. Schwartz? And are this, is this working? Yeah. Oh, it is? Okay, good. All right. All right. Thank you both. That was a great presentation. I have a, a million questions, as I'm sure the audience does too, so I'm just going to jump into it. Uh, and a lot of things like I didn't think about till I heard you say it. Uh, so I'm going to start with this question, uh, and this really came from something you said, Dr. Lee, uh, is I wonder how social isolation contributes to our current political climate. Mm. Oh, either one of you can take that. Close to my mouth? Okay. <laughs> so that is a really, really good question. Is it okay? I don't, it doesn't sound on. Is that even working? Oh, it's working. Okay. So I think that when I, you know, I'll, I'll sort of take off my Harris Center hat right now because we're a semi-governmental organization and give my personal individual perspective. I do think that when individuals throughout the pandemic were at home, they were socially isolated, they weren't in a place where you could really face somebody and say some things, I think it led to more polarization politically. My, my assessment and my view on it is that, you know, when we look at both the literature as well as trends, um, there's sort of more of a um, critical nature that is being shared in, um, you know, in the dialogue. And I think that there's been much more of a um, emphasis around one side being right or the other side being right, as opposed to how can we work toward harmony? How can we use public good toward um, excellent services for the community? And so I've observed that this is an independent contributor toward, um, you know, less engagement in dialogue and more focus around thinking one one side um, approach. And so, yeah, that, that's my opinion again. <laughs> so the answer is connection and, and dialogue. It sounds like the answer is for what's going on currently. Uh, so I, one of the things I thought about a lot when both of you were speaking was systems change. And you had some great examples of what to do individually, but you both also mentioned systems that lead to isolation. So just giving like an example, at University of Houston downtown, we're a commuter campus. Uh, we often have, our students are a little bit older. A lot of our students have their own families. Uh, some don't. 
if you were going to set up this our current university to to combat social isolation, what kind of things would you put in place? Sure. Thank you for that. Um, first off, events like this. This is phenomenal. So just having these informal convenings where individuals can share ideas, you can engage in meaningful dialogue, whether it be online or together, it has that element of commonality, that ability to be able to see other individuals who share like thought, like interests, et cetera. But also, the great part about at least this university, there's already over 500 or more certified um, student organizations on campus. Well, that's a lot of opportunity to engage. So whether it's a commuter campus or not, I think one of the things, and I think Stephen brought this up earlier, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to do things online. And then there's an opportunity to have blended approaches where you can be in person or you could be online. Well, lean into the face-to-face. -face. And it's one thing to be able to engage as much as possible and have those opportunities. And maybe you can't commute, but that doesn't mean that just because you're not there that you can't interact with these individuals in a meaningful way. You can also save that time to be able to interact with those individuals more close to home or in your own social networks because you're not commuting. So as long as you're utilizing that time for connection, it can really do great things. But I feel like based on this university and the wealth of resources that it has, there's a lot of great opportunity. But things like this and capitalizing on the existing systems that play the organizations, I think you all have a Greek system. You have different centers and institutes. There's a lot that can be done that bring people together. And if it's not necessarily something that you're already involved in because of your academic studies or your interests, maybe you look around and you do something different. And that's how you can also connect with individuals because you can learn from each other, you can teach each other things. And then, of course, that's a, a great way of forming a connection. Yeah, I have some other thoughts around that too. I think that as a school, it's a real great vehicle to think about, hey, like, can we pilot the things that can be the most engaging and interactive and connected um, for our students, right? I mean, people are commuting for something, oftentimes class. And so can the classroom be designed in such a way that it fosters group learning that allows for engagement, right? Like we have, I remember in my freshman year in school, I was part of Rutgers University, also public university, where, you know, it was a class, freshman class of 10,000 plus, okay? And our 101 biology class was, you know, 300 people in a lecture. Well, do you have to organize that way? Could it be? slightly different. Could we use the time we spent in class to foster engagement? Could there be interactive approaches to really deepen the learning while individuals are on campus? And I also think when you think about the ways public universities are structured, you can identify the student base to include individuals um, that really are interested, right? As part of the admission process, could we ask a question around what are you hoping to gain out of school and is connection part of that? And so when I think about structure, you know, build it into the natural structure. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity. Thank you both for that. Okay. Um, we have an online question. Yeah, typically, as a philosophy student that focuses on AI ethics mm -hmm. and focuses on discussion and judicial perspectives, I decided in the political climate that's been harder to communicate, we should replace discussion and dialogue with a new way of saying the trade of information. I like that idea better than the um, I have a follow-up that kind of relates to that. You want me to go and then we'll go back to you. Uh, so that was a question kind of, or a comment more about AI. And I did notice both of you talked about technology. And when I was like talking about this presentation today to my colleagues, that's the question that kept coming up is, you know, you may have 1,000 friends on social media who like everything you post, but it might not be, it, it, it may be more of a superficial connection. 
and does that prevent deeper connection? And what, what, what should you do about that? Ooh, so just because people online can't hear, uh, so we should maybe, no, no, you're good. But uh, yeah, no, you did a good job. Uh, so the comment was kind of the new AI, which is artificial intimacy. Uh, so I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on that. Absolutely, so technology can be, you know, almost considered that double-edged sword, right? Because naturally we certainly want to use the technology and it has a great way of convening if you can't be together. And I think the pandemic really showed that we don't have to be anywhere because we can attend, we can do our jobs, we can really interact with anybody from anywhere. So geography and proximity don't matter for certain things. But when you talk about connection, they certainly do. I think one of the things is, is that They've done studies showing that youth and older adults who use more social media or use technology more does not necessarily have a return in terms of feeling less lonely, feeling less isolated. And so the issue really becomes, are you using this as a tool or are you using this more as a crutch or sometimes even a shield? Are you missing opportunities because you're using technology too much where you're now forfeiting the opportunity for human interaction face to face? something more engaging, something more meaningful. And so one thing that is also kind of interesting with this is that when we talk about cohesion, when we talk about bonding, when we talk about the ways that individuals are really having that sense of group or connection, the internet gives a platform for people to be very vocal and find individuals from everywhere so that they can form those, but it also creates an opportunity to be shielded and say terrible things and therefore creating wedges, creating animosity, conflict, and everything else, which is actually anti-connection. So I think that if it's used as a tool, it's wonderful, but as soon as it's overused or misused or replacing the opportunity for true meaningful interaction, uh, it starts to become a very big problem. Yeah, and that's an interesting connection to the earlier question on our current political discourse, too. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts related to this question as well. I, I think on the whole, social media, at least I've observed in groups around me and um, with you know, the, the studies that are coming out, it is a, a potential tool, right? I think there's sort of a careful calibration around when it really starts to become polarizing and also concerning for uh, individuals that are part of it. And then I also think that, you know, depending on your baseline, it could be your only connection. And so if your baseline is that you are having challenges and you know don't have any other easy way to connect with others, whether it's transportation, other types of barriers, it becomes you know, a really important space for connection. I mean, I, I have had clients and patients where, you know, they just couldn't go anywhere but Zoom church during COVID, right? They just didn't have any other way of connecting besides using technology because of their physical health being so deteriorated. So I don't think that it's a panacea. I also don't think it's the devil either, right? And so you just have to really look at the way in which it's calibrated for your own personal experience. Right, and you have to have awareness, self-awareness, insight around how technology might either enhance or detract from how you experience the world. Because at the end of the day, it's how you perceive the interaction that you have with the other and your expectation of that interaction that determines how you engage, right? And that's, that's really the piece where you could feel like you're you know, really having that deep connection through internet means, right? And you could also feel like it's, it's really detrimental to you. And so you kind of have to assess what that's like for you when you're interacting with technology. 
Thank you both. That's, it's interesting and it's a nice segue. And I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to go out to the audience. So start thinking of your questions. Uh, but the subjective nature of loneliness and isolation is really interesting. Like, like the research that would show that people who are getting most of their connections online aren't getting that need met is really interesting. But I also think about, uh, and you both mentioned this, that it's really your experience of it. And is introversion and extroversion a big part of that? And then I'm doing a two-part question because my last question. <laughs> people keep talking about how it's harder to make friends as an adult. So I'm curious about like the, what you're seeing in intergenerational loneliness, if you're seeing that as a barrier for people. So it's, it's really two different questions, but I'm putting them together because my last question. Sure, I mean, so personality traits are interesting when you really want to think about the, the isolation and loneliness because you're right, a lot of introverted people, like they would, if given the option, not show up. I mean, it's great. They would like to be that way and they're totally happy and content with that. But um, I think what's really interesting about that is that when you're an introvert or an extrovert, it might dictate how you interact, but not necessarily who you interact with or what your inner circle is. So I think it's a really kind of an, an interesting question that I don't know if I can 100% answer, but you know, I know so many individuals that are just 100% totally okay being out in nature because that's the way they're going to connect, connect with themselves. And I think a lot of that comes down to the self-reflection of what you need. So a lot of it comes down to the preference. What is it that you really want? What is it that you really think you need? And then of course, are you going to get that? And remember, loneliness is that comparison of what you're actually getting compared to what you want to get. And if you want more than you're actually getting, that's the feeling of loneliness. So therefore, if you're introverted and you don't need a lot, then you're not going to feel that way necessarily. But if you're extroverted and you really need a lot of it and you're not getting enough, that's great. Some people are surrounded by a million friends online, but they only need one who can talk about you know, the 1970 Yankees. And that's what I need to feel connected, is somebody to really talk to me about what I'm truly interested in, not necessarily liking a picture or something to that effect. So. I don't know if I answered any of the questions you asked. Yeah. Uh, but that's that was great. Thank you. Yeah, so most of the folks I've seen in behavioral health contexts, especially those that come either in psychiatric hospitals, in outpatient clinics, emergency rooms, what I've experienced is that mental health is introversion, extroversion, agnostic. Okay, so in some ways, I've seen folks that come in that, you know, they're, they're, they're terrified, terrified of being able, of being, their phone being pulled away, right? It's a whole big, you know, thing around, hey, like, you got to take care of your mental health. And they're like, well, I have to respond to them. And they get distressed. And we've also had folks where, you know, they don't have a single friend and they didn't care, but their mental health needs are something completely different, <laughs> right? And so I don't think that introversion, extroversion, when you think about the dependent, uh, you know, the dependent factor of how you perceive the world is really gonna make it or break it. It's just really relative dependent on what your needs are as mentioned earlier. Thank you both. Do you have something else you want to add? No, okay. Thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? I'm going to do Phil Donahue and come out with the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's really interesting to hear what's going on with loneliness from a national perspective and also a local perspective. I'm also curious because I think it's become a part of a global conversation as well what lessons there might be learned from other research in other countries for what we're seeing in trends for loneliness and either what they're doing really well or something that's not working that we want to avoid considering here. Uh, where to start and where to end. Um, you know, a lot of countries are doing things quite differently. One of the challenges that we have in the United States is that we are very large in terms of population and land mass. So therefore the physical connection and isolation uh, can actually be exacerbated just based on true proximity. We do not do public transit as well as other countries, and therefore anybody doesn't necessarily 
go where they need to go. When you have a smaller population, it's also easier to give them the other support systems and the support services that they need. So then all of a sudden we have gaps here, and we all know this. So we could take a lot of pages from other countries in terms of the transportation and the infrastructure, but also sometimes just the revering of older adults. There are certain cultures even within our own United States that just do better. They take in the older adult and create intergenerational homes. Now, not to say that it's um, you know, not a good thing to go into a residential or assisted living community, but at the same time, there's a lot of the coming into the home and having that shared experience, that support, that familiarity that is just quite wonderful and it creates a great bond across those generations. Um, another thing that's really interesting is that there are countries that have taken residential facilities and combined them with preschools. Am I right? I know. And so again, now you have this intergenerational activity that's happening all the time. It's actually in memory care. Uh, so with that, we have a lot of great opportunities, but we're not necessarily adopting those just yet. Uh, so I do think that there's a lot there in terms of those, but also we are among the last. You know, the United Kingdom created the uh, campaign to end loneliness, and they started this. Australia and New Zealand have been doing this for a long time. We're joining, but we're joining a little late. So at least we can take those pages, but we're not necessarily leading. And again, it's a lot because we are a very big, very diverse population, so it's kind of hard to manage. Yeah, and the other thing I kind of wonder about is why are we late, right? And so in some ways I, I do wonder about how the United States fares in terms of how you know, our culture might be different, right? Like the, the reason is like, even in my home, for example, my mother-in-law is Indian and, um, you know, before breakfast, she's made eight calls to people in India when she stays over. So culturally, it's a much more engaged social culture where uh, she knows her neighbors, she knows the people around her, she knows her intergenerational family context and, um, you know, my next door neighbors won't, won't engage. And what is that fabric of community like in America? And how has that changed even as time has passed, right? And so we, we have experienced some differences. And I also think as a culture, we, we focus a lot around independence, around, um, you know, really less um, about the social fabric at times and the community fabric at times than we might sort of around, you know, the, the smaller ecosystems. And I don't know if Matthew has more to say about that. It's a phenomenal. And I think one of the other things is I kind of opened with the way we talk about things. And I think, unfortunately, mental health and these topics, when you start asking someone if they're lonely, they kind of get defensive. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's now you're putting them on a defensive because it's now a judgment. There's a stigma associated with being lonely or expressing your feelings, especially for, well, I'll just say a lot of men and other, they don't necessarily talk about these things. But the issue is, is like, for example, when we were trying to learn more about loneliness, we were taking some of the measures that we were using and translating them into other languages. So we met with native individuals and native speakers and we wanted to learn more. So for example, when we started asking questions about loneliness and we were translating this into Vietnamese, they were saying, but to, to be lonely means that I'm longing for that connection. It's actually a very wonderful thing that I'm lonely and that I miss you. And we were like, well. So the way that we're using the language, we're trying to get at certain topics, but in other countries and other contexts, um, certainly there's just different ways of thinking about and connecting. And I really actually found that kind of beautiful. It's nice to be lonely because you want more. That is beautiful. And what a great question, because it's so interesting to get out of our context into a different context and think about the same issues. So thank you. We have time for one more in the room question, and then we're going to move to a couple of the online questions. Hi. Um, so as a um, alumni of UHD and been working here as part time, just connect trying to my job is to connect with the students. But what I've been hearing a lot from you is connectivity, um, human interaction. That's super important for just in general for humans to thrive and continue and be um, just 
grow as individuals, but how do you, you implement that when there's a lot of universities kind of transitioning to this online platform, and when you're transitioning that, the, when you're doing any Zoom meeting or anything, a lot of times our students and even faculty often have their cameras off, and how, um, like in reality, how many of those students are actually paying attention to the course and making that human connection. And I've been seeing such a drop since I started college from um, being in community college that's so, everyone was so active and full of life, I felt like. And then once COVID happened, you stopped seeing students hang around campus, enjoying these social atmospheres. And you, since students aren't enjoying them, they're often like kind of um, disappearing those atmospheres. So what would you, what would you suggest faculty and staff and even students to do to bring that connectivity back on campus, but also bring it online? Yeah. Great question, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to start. I, I, I think a lot of what you're talking about is what motivates somebody to be connected and stay connected, right? And so if there's not a broader vision around, hey, like I'm here to learn and part of that learning is really supported by the social networks that I'm part of and that isn't agreed upon, then yeah, like I'd much rather turn off my camera and go do something else while half paying attention. But I think if there is a context put in about the fact that you are going to get a whole lot more out of it if you're here with us and that that group agrees upon it, then I think you can really engage a little differently. Because when you have a social agreement that, hey, like we're all going to keep our cameras on, and we're going to do this in order to support one another's learning and really be successful together because we're all here together, then it's a different investment than saying, oh, yeah, I just have to go to class. I just, you know, I'll, I'll do it. Nobody's going to monitor. Nobody's going to hold me accountable if I don't, you know. So you can do the part where you essentially say, here's the hammer, and if you don't turn on your camera, it's not going to count toward points. But I think that doesn't get at the connection you're talking about. What gets at it is really better understanding what's motivating the students to show up, right? Like, how can we use that motivation to guide them toward being able to deepen that connection because it is going to serve them better. It's hard. I mean, I will say as um, a clinical educator, it was one of the things where I felt less enjoyment teaching during the pandemic, partially because of the fact that the cameras were off. You didn't realize whether or not the team and the group that you're talking to really was committed to the subject. And so I think it's not respectful for the teachers also when that takes place. And so it is really trying to motivate in a different lens, I think. Couldn't agree more. And we did institute a camera on policy and therefore it has to be on for everybody or you just need to get dropped off. So interestingly enough, but that's not necessarily social connection, that's actually just education. So what we've done a really great job of, and I try to enforce every single time that I have a group of like a new cohort of doctoral students, a new cohort of master's students, is that it's a cohort. You are all gonna go through the same experiences, have similar challenges, you're in this together on a similar timeline. That is a common element that now brings a bond to support one another and to now think of it that way in terms of networking. And if that's the case, then it really starts to become, I'm going to engage more because I'm going to get something out of this. Even after graduation, now I'm forming my network. I know what I'm going to do later. And beyond that, you know, we, we've also, beyond kind of the cohort mentality, we've tried to go ahead and just identify those different um, interprofessional education opportunities. So can we go ahead and say, well, just because I'm in a school of public health, can we go ahead and join with nursing and pharmacy and dentistry? Can we do something that's more experiential learning so that it's not always something that we just sit on Zoom, 
maybe we can't all get together and everyone hates group work, but like group work and things where we have to have common strategies and a lot of interaction to be able to come to a solution. Just a few of those. Thank you very much for that. That was a great question. And I'm going to have Mr. Villano come up and ask a couple. We have about, ooh, we have about three minutes left, so maybe just one online question. Okay. All right, so the question I have here is, can you explain or give an example of healthy, positive peer pressure approaches? I'm sorry, I'll, I'll jump in. I thought you brought up the peer pressure. Yeah, absolutely. So there's peer pressure right there. Um, and so, <laughs> case in point. Um, so I think that, OK. So New Year happened, well, it's April already, but January 1st every year, there's usually a thinking of, I am going to be healthy, all right? It's going to be the running goal, the gym goal, or some other goal, okay? And so usually what we think about that can help is an accountability partner or a running group or something that you can tag along to where those that are around you are going to help motivate you to go further, perform differently, right? And so if you're establishing a new habit, if you're around others that are all doing great and you're you know, like worried about getting left behind, then you joining on can absolutely motivate you to get toward different success goals. And that's actually a business model that's been used, whether it's CrossFit or Peloton or some others, where you're trying to motivate so that you're not in the bottom three, or you're just doing it to get it done. And what we have observed in the social context is essentially when you're part of those groups, when you're done, when you're able to be part of CrossFit or a gym where you're doing the social part, that motivates you to get your New Year's goal done for longer, more consistently, and with more engagement. And so it helps you build healthy habits that then have um, more engagement. So, hey, if I know Johnny is going to go to CrossFit next Saturday at 9 a.m. and I like him, I'm more likely to actually go versus, oh, I got to go to do the weights by myself upstairs. Home gyms, it's not, it's not quite the same as if you had a group somewhere that you connect to. I think that's, those are wonderful examples. And I think that you know, generally peer pressure is just encouragement. So just use it as encouragement. I mean, if there's something that you're thinking is a good idea, then encourage other people to do it. That's all peer pressure really is. Like, hey, we're gonna go do something really negative in the back alley. Well, at the same time, like, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you about this and I wanna go grab some, you know, pizza. I wanna go do, well, then encourage everyone to come with. Just encouraging the good activities and encouraging those opportunities are going to be the same as any other peer pressure. But I agree, the accountability piece is huge. But also just understanding, you know, part of the peer pressure is saying that you have a peer. And so you need to find the common element that makes you want to have a connection with that individual for it even to start to work. So therefore, common interests, you know, common activities, common experiences, those are going to be the things that really create that peer group and then, of course, that's now where you start to motivate one another to do things, encouragement. Just one last note before we wrap up. Isn't it great that we're all connecting around the topic of loneliness? Oh my goodness, isn't it great that we're just getting awareness around how important this topic is? So that is at least one thing um, that we as a group have in common. So moving toward bond formation, I just want to take it to the present toward um, gratitude again for thanking you for being here, for being in this space together to learn about something that's really um, important socially, but also for the country, for the world. So. And there was one final question, and you spoke about it a little bit with motivation, but if a person doesn't have motivation, we might say that they might need to go to a doctor or get medicine, but does medicine, is taking any kind of medicine, pill, whatever, going to increase your motivation? 
Isn't that more of a purpose thing? Yeah. Motivation for what? But if they say, I mean, some of the people that I, I've, I've um, worked with in Meals on Wheels, they're just not motivated. Mm -hmm. They're alone. You, why don't you do this? No, I don't want to do that. Why don't you, well, what about trying this? No, I don't want to. What, what about calling this person? No, they're not going to come. So how do you get them motivated? Yeah. I mean, and does medicine, is medicine going to all of a sudden fix that? Is that the panacea? I, I don't personally think that medicine is going to fix the motivation for things. I think that what it really comes down to is a bit more of seeing an intrinsic reward and that's what motivation really boils down to. So is it that you can show examples of other people who are doing this and actually having positive benefits? Is it something that you can actually have a, an incentive or a reward for doing? Is there something that's going to be meaningful to me that I don't have now that if I do this, I will get? That's motivation. So I think part of it is learning more about what the it is and how it can benefit or play into your larger life. And then of course you'll be able to say, well, then certainly, if I do that, then it should be able to better me, and I should be able to have a more positive experience, and that's where the motivation comes. If you don't see that motivation, you're not likely to do it, and also, if you start to do it and you don't like it, you're probably not going to do it either way, so therefore, it's motivation meets preference, and I think that's part of it, too, is uh, preference and reward. All right, so... The important thing to note is that there's not a magic bullet in the, in, the, in the world, right? There is not a magic secret sauce pill that's gonna get you to the optimal space, okay? Um, so that's important to note. And there are some psychiatric conditions of which a motivation or lack thereof motivation is a core component, right? Depression is case in point, right? If you have depression and you are not motivated, low energy, low interest in anything, just what we call anhedonic um, and feeling guilty about everything, having a, a, just a, a blueness about the world, just blueness, not interest in, in anything. And that's relative to the fact that at one point you weren't that, right? There's the potential that medication can help support your journey to recovering from the depression. In addition, what we have also noted from clinical studies is that adjunctive, which means added on to the medicine, if you did psychotherapy, which means you engage with somebody to receive counseling, to give get guidance, that connection toward the good, right? That connection and that interaction, that knowledge around how to recognize about your negative thoughts and turn it to a different, tilt it toward a different direction, that consistently over the period of time, plus the medicine, works much better than the medicine by itself. Similarly, if you just did the talk therapy and didn't do the medicine, that also didn't work as well. And so combining both is much better and enhanced in the treatment of depression, and that's typically what's recommended for the initial treatment for a person in major depression. So, so that's important to know because not having motivation could be a signal of something bigger, but sometimes it's not, and that's okay too. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope you folks enjoyed this evening's presentation. I hope you folks online enjoy the evenings, uh, this evening's presentation. I know I learned a lot. Uh, and um, I, I've, I've had some people ask if uh, the PowerPoints can be shared. Yep, OK. So um, and also, for those of you who would like, I am going to, for everyone who's uh, signed in uh, and those online, I'm going to send you the um, Surgeon General's report so you have a copy of that as well. Um, and then we can also share, if, if you want, if you let me know, email me, and I will share you the, the resources from uh, our presenter's PowerPoint. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, and good night.